Alien Confidential, hosted by Tony Topping. He's the paranormal 007, you know, and I am his Miss Moneypenny. Well, hello there. We've we've rolled out the red carpet for Alien Confidential. We are honoured, indeed. Our esteemed guest has joined us, listeners. It's going to be great. Really great show. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the opinions of author uh, and researcher Grant Cameron, who even surprised me with some of the stuff after listening to his interviews. Uh, and we're just so just so glad to have you on Alien Confidential. A good afternoon, Grant. Yeah, Tony, thanks for having me on. I appreciate your interest in what I'm doing. Oh, yeah, well, thank you. And it's Grant Cameron, and you've you've done many books, um, Grant. Just tell the listeners some of the books you've written. Um, I used to do a lot of uh, cover-up books. So I, my first book was the first book ever published by the MUFON organization in 1991, and that was on the whole uh, cover-up, the MJ-12 uh, scenario all the stuff that was going on in the 1980s where they were leaking material. And the, 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 the scenario I had then was that um, there's people inside the government who are um, gradually, they, they, they're pro-disclosure, so they're leaking material. But the way they cover it is plausible deniability. They cover it with um, disinformation. So you take the information, you put disinformation around it, you put it into the UFO community, and nobody knows what to believe, what not to believe. But the idea is, of what's going on, get out. And that keeps the control going and the cover up and stuff. So I did that the first book. And then um, I did a few more books like that about um, the the government thing. Cause I, I did the president thing. I I'd had a sighting in 1975 yeah. and yeah. I, I couldn't figure out um, what I'd seen, but I knew somebody had to know what, what was going on. Somebody had to know what that thing was that I saw. It just sort of blew me away. And I started going after the Canadian government. I studied them. And I actually have a book coming out on the Canadian government within the next a couple of weeks about oh, the wow. Canadian government role in, in UFOs. And, and from there, it led to Dr. Eric Walker. The Canadians have been told uh, very highly classified stuff. Like they wrote a top secret memo that said, we were told by American officials, flying saucers exist. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States. There's a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush um, could, trying to figure out what's going on. And this subject is of tremendous significance to the Americans. And we're also told by American officials that other things might be associated with flying saucers, such as mental phenomena. And that would come up later in my life. But uh, so I went to the Canadian government and we tried to figure out where did that information come from? Where did the Canadians get that? And we tracked it back to the Canadian embassy through a guy by a doc- named Dr. Robert Sarbacher and Stanton Friedman was involved. And he wanted to know, who, who who gave you this information? And he basically uh, said there was a, a recovery of a craft and there was a bunch of briefings at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, and said the ESP was involved, again, this metal phenomena thing, and uh, identified Dr. Eric Walker, who was the former president of Penn State University, the big engineering uh, Ivy League college in the United States, uh, had 14 honorary doctorate degrees, uh, the co-developer of the homing torpedo, uh, chairman of the board of the Institute for Defense Analysis, the top military think tank in the United States. We chased him around for about eight years, and that's when we wrote the first book, What Walker Had Told Us. We asked him all these questions, how did it work, uh, what's going on. He played these rhymes and riddles, leave it alone, there's nothing you can do about it unless you have the mind of really? Einstein. You're you wasting your time. Riddles with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, what he, that's what he would do. And he said, I can't talk about this. And there was actually a guy from Great Britain from, that was interviewing him. Uh, yeah. A guy who claimed to have been with the uh, with Iranian intelligence. Name his actual real name was Habib Azadadel, and he was known as Henry Victorian. And uh, he was very active. He was working in mind control. He was he actually got to Kissinger. He got to Kissinger's secretary. He would sit on the phone and he would impersonate people. And he was trying to get this information. He did a lot of the interviews with Dr. Eric Walker and got more out of Walker than anybody. But there was about six or seven people that were interviewing Come on. Walker. Can I just come in there, Grant? Yeah. Because yeah. Be, because you're a fascinating guy. And the thing is with you is that I've heard other guys speak. Uh, there's two who spring to mind who, sound, who can remain nameless, but they're big players, but they can talk for an hour about nothing. But what what I'm in, <laughs> what I'm interested about is the fact that you. Um, the first thing I want to talk about with you, uh, may, may I, is the uh, is your nineteen is your UFO incident, which I was fast. I didn't know that you'd had a UFO incident, and I'd like you to tell the listeners about that. And if you can also add to that the Canadian research under Project Magnet, and why you think, why you think, why you think the Canadian government assessed 
that there was a mental component to the UFO phenomena. I'm fascinated to hear your opinion. Okay. Well, my sighting basically happens in 1975. I'm going to university at the time. I uh, can't figure out what the heck I'm going to do with all this nonsense at university, how you make any money out of this crap. And I, I just was frustrated. I had no interest in UFOs. I point this out over and over again. I never thought about ETs, never thought about e UFOs. Wow. And and what was happening is I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, which is right in the middle of, of Canada. And there was a small town called Carmen, Manitoba, which is about 35 miles outside of the city going towards the U.S. border. And uh, they were having these sightings over and over again. And they put in an anti-ballistic missile unit in the United States. The only operational anti-ballistic missile unit ever put in the United States it was 100 new nuclear missiles. And what they were, it was like the pre-Star Wars, where they were going to shoot down the Russian missiles as they came in, take them in and outer space and stuff like that. So once they put this 100 new nuclear missiles, all this stuff started. I didn't realize this until years later. But I, I, I said to my friend, we used to drive around the city. And do nothing. Just, you know, like kids, just drive around and see what's going on and drive around, drive around, do nothing. So I said, well, Larry, instead of driving around the city, why don't we go out to Carmen and see what these people are looking at? Because it was in the newspaper all the time. And it seemed like it was there all the time. And he said, OK, we'll go. But we didn't go. We didn't go for three months. And then the local TV station here caught the thing on the ground. It was on the ground and wow. it caught it jumping off the ground. It went wow. viral. Um, NBC picked it up. It was a viral film. Uh, and so then I said, come on, let's go, let's go see. What, and so I describe it as I bought the lottery ticket knowing there was a chance I could win, but knowing I'm not going to win. I'm not going to see anything. I mean, we're going to go out there, but we're not going to see anything. Everybody else sees it. We're not going to see a thing. We went out there. We drove around the town for an hour. I'm looking at stars, planets, and I, I have no interest in astronomy, so I don't know what we're looking at. And it's like, well, whatever they're looking at isn't very interesting. And then my friend says, okay, we'll drive back into Carmen one more time. If we don't see anything, let's go home. I said, fantastic. It's been a total waste of time. We turned to go back in the town. We're about a mile uh, east of the town. We turned to go back in the town, and there it is. And it is not a light in the sky. It is an object. It is down low, right in front of the car. It came from the left, from the south, from the American border, coming across right in front of the road, maybe a couple hundred feet up. It was a plasma object, a red, glowing plasma object. It looked like it was alive. It was moving up and down. It was bobbing like a, like a, like a bobber on a fishing line, right. moving up and down. It wasn't flying in a straight line. It was going very, very slow, maybe 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. And, and it was coming across the road. And I remember it was like I fell off the edge of the earth. I just like, ah. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I like this is for real. It was like you you read the things in the Bible and you say, oh, you know, the miracles. That's all garbage. You know that it, not, there's no miracles. And it, my life was like that. There was no weird stuff. There was no miracles and stuff. And it was like there is actually weird stuff. It's like this is actually. And I was getting out of the car as it was going because it was going in behind a set of school buses, and I wanted to see it because I knew it was going to. I was going to lose sight of this thing. It was so low and, uh, uh, above the ground. And remember, the car was still moving, and I was getting out of the car, and I was running across the ditch into this parking lot to watch this thing. And I remember it was flying away, and it was just slowly pulsing. It was flying away. Uh -huh. Then two nights later, I drag all my friends out there, and I say, man, you got to see this. This will change your life. And I was, I was so excited. I drag all my friends out there, and there's people from the town. I'm in a city of 725,000 people. There's a lot of people out there trying to see this thing. And we ran into a bunch of people in a, in a road there was 28 people when it for, when we first started. When it finally came, there was only about eight people left. But we were there, and uh, all my friends said, "Ah, now nah, we're going home." I said, "No, no, you got to see this. Stay, stay. You got to see this." And they go, "Oh, now we're Cameron. We're we're we're, we're hungry. We're going back to Winnipeg for pizza." I remember that. And off they went. And I was left there. And then about 15 minutes later, the thing came out. It's the second night, and it was it it was an object that changed. It was jumping around the sky. It was like. It was called, described the bouncing ping pong ball, like a ping pong ball jumping, bouncing around in the sky. And as it got closer to us, uh, the, the the ball got closer and closer. And then it turned out it was this object, this red plasma object that I'd seen two nights before. And it was very low again, close to the ground, coming directly at us. Uh, and maybe hard to say it, like you can't tell because, you know, uh, it's dark. So maybe half a mile away very close to the ground, clear object, not a light in the sky. And then it made this left-hand turn, and then it went flying off. And then I was looking at it, and I'm going, wow, that could be yeah. from another planet. And then, But yeah. I'm thinking to myself, and this came back years later, What the most important part of the whole story was, I looked at it, and I said, so what's it doing? And I go, 
It's not doing anything. It's just flying along. And that was the whole thing. It's like, what is really going on? When you see a UFO in the sky, Tony, like what's going on? Is it yeah. when it does a little zigzag, what's it doing? Like a pre-abduction maneuver? It's like, it's not doing anything. It's just, it, what, why do UFOs have lights on? So you can see them. They wanted me to see this thing. And I didn't realize this at that point. And it was the idea was I fell off the edge of the earth and I started, that's when I chased uh, the, the Canadian government because I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And that's when I figured somebody has to know what's going on. So yeah. I, uh, synchronistically, my father was yeah. a pilot for the Canadian government and a guy by the name of Ernie. Sorry, Grant, your, sorry, Grant, your father was a, just missed that. Your father was a, a pilot for the Canadian government. He was wow. former U S air force or uh, yeah. Canadian air force. And then yeah. he got a job with the department of transport. Now the department of transport was the same organization that put out Project Magnet, the Canadian yeah. Flying Saucer Investigation, from fifty yeah. to fifty-four. So my father yeah. worked, but he, we, he was he was not involved. He was he's in the middle. We're in the middle of the country, and Ottawa is on the east side of the country, the capital. So that's when the project was being run by Wilbert Brockhouse Smith. So my father had a guy in his office. His name is Ernie App, and my father says uh, Ernie App had a sighting. He wants to talk to you, and I said, Yeah, okay. So I go meet this guy, and he's a radar technician. And he said, uh, he tells me this sighting. It's just a light in the sky type sighting. And it's like, whatever. He's telling me the story or whatever. And then he says, you know, if you really want to know what's going on with UFOs, you should study what the Canadian government was doing. And I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, I used to work for the guy. And I said, you did? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And he said, uh, the guy, the guy whose name was Wilbert Smith. He was the yeah. smartest engineer I'd ever met in my life. But the guy was totally insane. He was, he was talking to aliens that were landing in his backyard. And I went, they were what? <laughs> I, I said, they really? <laughs> and so I said, oh, I'm going to go check this out. So I did the tracking and Wilbur had died in 62. So we're already talking now, 1976, 77. So uh, I, I'm determined I'm going, I'm going to Ottawa. I'm going to, I'm going to check this out. So his wife was still alive. Merle Smith was his wife. She worked for the Canadian Senate, and she was secretary of the Speaker of the Senate. So she was not a low-level person herself. And she was about to retire, and she was very upset because we had this uh, uh, situation in Canada. That's when the French, uh, the Canadian government turned over, and you had to speak French. And she was very upset about this whole thing, that now we got to speak French, and, and, and she was ready to retire. So she was, she was telling all. She had no secrets. And she started, and I remember driving, we were going to her son's place, where they had hidden the files, where all Wilbur's files had been hidden when he died. And her son's name was James. We were driving in the car, I remember, to see James. And she's telling me this whole thing. And she says, half of this, half of that. She's talking about this alien, like like he's a family pet. And I'm just like, I'm in another world. It's like, I can't believe this is happening, like that this stuff is for real. She, and she was like, you know, retirement age. She was a pretty straight lady. And I'm going like, wow, this is so cool. So anyway, um, I... I studied what the Canadian government was doing. And you mentioned this thing about the, the, the Americans. How, how did they know mental phenomena? But that was the whole thing. So Wilbert Brockhouse Smith, what was told to me, he had an inside group. So they, they were working. Uh, the government really was not keen on the whole idea. So he had these, uh, what was called, I called it the inner circle. So you had a guy from the Navy. You had a guy from the Air Force. He had a guy who was doing metal research uh, on pieces that the Americans were sending up from the Defense Research Board. He had all these guys, and it was sort of like an inner circle group that was working on this flying saucer thing with him. And um, uh, what, one of the um, things that they were they were doing, uh, one of the guys told me, the guy who was doing the meddlers, he said, do you know who, who, who Wilbur was? And I said, yeah, he was the head radio engineer for the Canadian government. And he said, no, but you know who he really was? Do you know what he did? I said, no, he was the, he was the radio engineer. He said, no. He ran Radio Ottawa. Do you know what Radio Ottawa is? And I said, no, I don't know what Radio Ottawa is. He said, it's like NSA. It's, we were, the Canadians had all, it was called Shirley's Bay. It's outside of Ottawa. It's now communications. And they had all these antennas. If you see the photographs from Wilbur Smith with the wow. Flying Cross Observatory, you see all these antennas. They were picking wow. off Russian communications. So Wilbur yeah. was running this whole operation. So he had this very high security clearance. And he was, he was working with negotiating with the Americans on, on FM radio frequencies, on, on who gets which frequency, and he controlled everything. He controlled all the channels, and at that time, the intelligence was using radio frequencies. So he was in, he was handing out the radio frequencies to the intelligence people. So he went down to the United States, and he was talking to the high level people in the United States. And that's where he, Wilbur Smith said, "I went down there and I started asking questions, and I, and and I realized 
there was a lot of smoke and where there's smoke, there's got to be fire. And he became interested. He realized the Canadian, the, 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 the Americans knew and he got in, he was actually dealing with um, indirectly through um, Donald Kehoe ran NICAP. He was actually dealing with Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush was the guy, the main guy who ran the atomic bomb program, who ran all the technology for um, the World War II. There was Tizard was the guy in Great Britain. Uh, the Canadian guy was Salant, and the guy in Great Britain in the United States was was Vannevar Bush. He ran the UFO program. He ran the, the atomic bomb program. He ran all the technology for World War II. And Wilbur was dealing indirectly with this guy. They were sending pro uh, information on propulsion and this kind of stuff and so what wilbur had had gotten that's when he wrote the top secret memo he came back to canada and he said i made discreet inquiries through the canadian embassy in washington dc and this is what i was told by american officials not people on the street not secretaries american officials and later on when i talked to his son his son confirmed i said did you ever ask your father about the crash he said yeah my father just before he died realized there's nothing they could do to him anymore and he told me yes i was shown a craft outside of washington dc that we sort of think might have been andrews air force base uh and he saw the bodies and of course i immediately said well were they grays he said no they weren't grays i mean but they were like the 1950 description like human beings wilbur actually said they could pass on the street. You would not know who they were. I and would know the who thing they were. Grant, isn't it, that's kept out. That's the thing, Grant. That's kept out of the internet photos and all that. That they look like us. It's very carefully controlled. Is all that, isn't it? That they, and and just to ask a further question. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Uh, a, a further question on this is that the the mental component of the UFO phenomena, I think, was to do with uh, quantum communication and all that kind of thing. I noticed yeah. in the in AATIP that that's classified. They classified it. Yeah. Well, what I would say is it's all that that's the basic thing that I was told later on when I started bo yeah. doing books on consciousness and stuff. It's all consciousness. That's how it oh, works. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. what, that's what Walker said to us. Dr. Eric Walker, the guy with the 14 oh, yeah. honorary doctorate degrees said, yeah. look, let me ask you a question. He's talking to the British guy. So let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? And the guy didn't have any answer. He said, look, unless you understand about ESP, and how it works. You will not be taken in by the controls group. Very people understand how it works. It's all consciousness. And so it's the, even the thing with the beings, if you see, if you've, if you've ever interviewed John, um, uh, Jim Penniston, Jim Penniston in his book talks about being contacted by Kit Green. Now, Kit Green is the guy who ran the, rem the remote viewing program for the CIA. He's been in this business. He's got the longest held top secret security clearance in the United States, except for maybe Hal Putoff. <laughs> And, and he That's says, well. he told, hmm? he told Jim Penniston, he said, we know now we know that the beings that you see are influenced by your belief system. So if you're very religious, you're going to see a, a being that yeah. is a, a religious figure. If you're, if you're in fear, you're going to see a gray. J John Mack was bringing this up before. Yeah. And it's this idea that we are influenced what we see. Almost like yeah. there's an experience. I don't know if you ever talked to him. His name is Yossi Ronan. We helped yeah. him publish his book out of, out of Israel. And he said, and I quote, and if you see my email, I always quote what he was told by the beings. The being said, when we come into your world, yeah. We do not need a body. We take on a body that suits you. We don't need it. But we, 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 we do it to interact with you. And you can do the same thing. You just don't realize it. So it's the whole idea that we, we think that it's an independent, objective thing outside ourselves. We don't realize we're part of what we're seeing. So if you're in fear, you're going to see a gray. If you're a very high energy person, uh, in, especially with the sex thing, you're going to see a reptilian and, and this kind of thing that we are influencing what we're seeing. Or almost like if you've studied the Chris Bledsoe case, who's a good friend of mine, who's being watched by U.S. intelligence, by uh, all the military people. They're trying to figure out how does this guy have this high level of contact and the first time he saw the beings in 19, when he did the regression and he drew it, he p started painting. He painted the being. It was this tall being, seven feet tall, bluish green. And it, it, was, it, was, it was one that appeared in the, the crop circle yeah. in 2002 in Great Britain, that alien. That's yeah, his yeah. alien. And, yeah. and yet when he, in 2012, uh, he's not talking about it. And they pull him to tell him, Chris, you have a burden that is yours to carry. You are to carry the message. You are to talk about this. And they pull him. And at that time, they're no longer these seven foot tall bluish green beings. Uh, they are now in hoods. 
where you could not see the face. And then when the when he got into the yard, when they take him into the yard, and he's given this thing to hold, it's not allowed to to put down. It's it's alive. It's prickling his hands and this sort of stuff. Then he looks at him, and they're like beings of light. And that's what you see. What Yossi Ronan says: the being that comes to Yossi Ronan in in uh, the, uh, in 1981 is a green being. It's a green. It looks like an ale, like a like a um, like a gray, yeah. except it's green. And yes. he said, when they left, and this is the important thing: when they left, he said they all grabbed hands and they made a circle and they started to make this circle and they went faster and faster and faster and faster, round and round and round and round. And he said, suddenly they became translucent. You could see through the beings. And then it got, it got closer and closer and it became a ball of light and then the ball of light disappeared. And so that's no, what I say. Grams. Sorry to interrupt you. Can I go, go to, this is absolutely fantastic. What was the guy's name? Chris Boosen, did you say? Chris Bledsoe. Chris, Chris Bledsoe is the guy that the NASA people said he's the ambassador for NASA. That's what the NASA people were telling them. He, he's a guy, if you've read uh, Diane Pasolka's book called American Cosmic, there's a guy, the whole book is about this Tyler D that she talks about. Well, Tyler D it watches Chris, everything he does. So Chris is uh, this high-level guy. He has, he has 15,000 videos and photographs. On his cell phone, he can bring these things in. They're around the CIA's there all the time, and what they're trying to figure out, and what they should do, is to say, "Who are you talking to? How do you make this contact?" So that's what Kid Green is doing now. That's why he went to Jim Peniston. He wanted to get Jim Peniston's DNA, and he wanted to get Jim Peniston an MRI. They have a program. It's financed by Bob Bigelow. There's eight people on this committee. And what they're doing is they're going to experiencers. Kit Green is involved. Gary Nolan's involved. And they're looking at the DNA of experiencers and trying to figure out why are some people able to contact the beings? Have they got something in their brain, like an antenna that gets yeah. to do this kind of stuff? And they're watching these experiencers. So that's why they went to John can I just come in there, Grant, and yeah. just ask you a question, uh, which yeah. intrigues me. Uh, I've been 40 years at the sharp end of this. I have uh, been a witness. Um, now, the thing that, that is interesting is in the early bit, the Roswell UFO crash, uh, Operation Paperclip, somewhere within that, uh, somewhere within what you describe, the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. And somewhere in this narrative, somebody somewhere bought a used UFO from dodgy alien car salesman and regretted it ever since. I've seen it firsthand what I'm on about here, and I'm being quite, I'm not fully studying, but it's quite unpleasant what's going on. How do you think, uh, if at all, in your narrative, in your story, that fits in? How did that happen? I have reason to suspect that the Nazis under Operation Paperclip perhaps came in with UFO data and it has been corrupt to the core ever since. Would I be right in that assessment? I see it differently. I think the, the right. Nazi thing is to throw people off as to okay. – um, uh, I think a lot of what's happening in the United States is just a lot of military bravo, that we have this thing all figured out. They haven't got a clue. If no. you look at the Wilson leak document, it says at the very end, and this has been said by high level people. I've, I've chased, that's what I've did. I chased the highest level people, CIA, Ron Pendolfi, CIA, Kit Green, uh, all these people, the president of the United States. I've found the highest level people. And what do they say? And basically, um, what I think has happened. And you, you, if you've seen, did you see the interview with, um, George Knapp and, uh, Bigelow the other day? So Bigelow says, he says exactly the same thing that Tyler D says. Tyler D was taken to a crash site by a friend of mine in New Mexico. And he went, he flipped out. He, he said, this is the real deal. And and so he takes Diane Pasolka there and he takes Gary Nolan. He blindfolds him. He takes him to New Mexico to this thing. And they call it the gifting field. And mm -hmm. if you see the interview with Bob Bigelow, suddenly mm -hmm. Bob Bigelow says, he's asked about crashes. He said, well, yeah, there's a Roswell crash. And yeah, there was a crash in Russia. There was a crash in uh, China. There's a crash in South America. You got to remember, Bob Bigelow's been on the leading edge. He's got a lot of money. He's had talked to the top people. He said, you know what? I think they may be seeding this stuff. This is the idea that they are actually crashing. They're dropping this material on purpose. And you take the meta material. I say to people, give your head a shake. If you think that a flying saucer came across a galaxy and then little pieces started falling off the flying saucer, you need to have your head checked. 
That's so not what's going on. Yeah. This yeah. is they're dropping this stuff. They're dropping this stuff. It's it's I have the thing where I, I show like the, the UFO in the sky is like the laser. If you've ever seen a cat with a laser, you take the laser pointer and the cat's chasing it around. That's what they're doing. They're showing these UFO sightings. They're getting you to say, what is going on? Something's going on. Reality is not the way I think it is. They're making yeah. us think. And that's why they dropped the metal. I, it, to me, it's like the, it's like they throw the catnip into the, into the, into the, into the, into the, the room and the cat goes totally crazy. From my, so, from my uh, perception, Grant, of this, yeah. uh, based on my 40 years in dealing with this, there is some liaison going on that yeah. is a bit dodgy, in my opinion. Uh, there is some classified liaison going on. There's some of it I can't talk about. Uh, I, I'm not just saying that for sure. I, I've just witnessed it, and I'm trying to fit into the narrative where that jigsaw is fitting in, because whatever it is, is beyond Big Low. It's beyond the American government, but it's present. I, I'm, I'm talking too much now about it, but it's there, and it's quite frightening. And I don't know what it is that they're covering up, but they're covering up something. Would well, they're covering up that? They're, they're covering up their ignorance. There's a tape that we're going to release. I don't know if you've heard it. It's a right. tape by Kit, Kit Green. Now, okay. Kit Green ran the weird desk at the CIA. He ran the remote right. viewing program for the U.S. He's yeah. always been trying to brief into uh, um, alien autopsies. And he yeah. says, the American Uncle Sam is clueless. And there's a bunch oh, of intelligence people playing bad games because they're trying to get into the game. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And he said, the whole idea is that we have no clue. It, it was called the core story. We are being visited by some sort of intelligence. We have crash saucer material. We have material, and we haven't got a clue how to do it. In the Wilson leak document, it talks about the fact we have a craft, and we think it can fly. Yeah, and that is true. They have a craft, I believe, that, that is totally intact, but they cannot fly it because you need consciousness to turn it on it's like your cell phone where you need your your fingerprint to turn on the cell phone that's Absolutely. what it is people don't realize that it Absolutely. it's it's consciousness if i've got 50 people chris bledsoe was one i've got uh for, I, I discovered the consciousness connection in 2012 i was put in contact with a lady in her 70s who told me she was flying the flying saucer i said yeah. you are flying the flying saucer it's like come on i mean like get real and it's yeah i've flown three different models and i go really they let you fly the flying saucer yeah I said, well, how do you fly a flying saucer? She said, oh, they let you, you, you do it with your mind. I have a guy from Liverpool who flew the flying saucer. Chris Bledsoe, yeah. I heard, you flew the flying saucer? Tell me yeah. how this works, Chris. And yes. everybody yes. says the same thing. You walk in the craft. The craft is alive. Yes. You put your hand on a panel. You put Correct. your hand on a ball. Or you put your hand on a, on a yeah. thing on the wall. And Correct. you become one with the craft. The craft is life. You and the craft are one. And whatever you think is what the craft does. It's consciousness. That's why they can't turn it on. We have no clue how this consciousness. So we may have hardware. We may Let have me all give the you an insight, Grant. Sorry to interrupt you. Mate. If I'm, just indulge me, if, if, if you may. Um, during the course of my experiences, which I write about in my book, I've had interaction with Nordic extraterrestrials. I make no apology for it. They're, they've got bases out here. I think that by comical irony, probably the last people to know are the American government and other governments probably know. But the thing is, is that during my interaction with their craft, I know for a fact that their long story, but I know for a fact that their craft are artificially intelligent. The triangle crafts possess their own mind. Now, in the interaction I had, there was a thing that went on where this craft desired to know consciousness and spirituality as it was a machine. It couldn't do that. It's like the famed Daleks here in Britain trying to get up the stairs. It just could not do it. And it was try. I remember the incident where it was probing my mind to elevate its consciousness into the cosmic information channel field. And it was, it was finding it fascinating because they're artificially intelligent. But among the ETs, there is serious spiritual and ethical concerns among these ET groups that a machine intelligence doing that kind of thing is not a good thing. Um, that's just my take on, on what I witnessed. Uh, and this is going on. You're quite right. It's absolutely consciousness, isn't it? I mean, for example, you say in one of your interviews, which I was fascinated with, that you had a download. And I wonder if you could tell the listeners about that, because I found it fascinating. Well, I've had two major downloads, and yeah. I've got um, – I'm actually writing a book right now, uh, which will be out in a month, which talks about um, – I won't get into that. Uh, but I've had two major ones. 2012 was the first one I had. I'm watching Colin Andrews' lecture in Phoenix, Arizona. 
Colin Andrews is talking about crop circles. I have no interest in crop circles whatsoever. But because he's a high-level researcher, I say, I should pay him the respect. I should go watch his lecture. I say, okay, I'll go watch it. Not in your choice. I'll go watch it. I'm sitting in the lecture, and I zone out. That's one of the contact modalities. That's how you get in the field. You've got you to shut off the ego, shut off the left mind. So I'm zoning out. I'm not really paying attention to what he's saying. And it comes into my head instantaneously, this consciousness thing. And at that time, Colin Andrews was talking about consciousness. I started, now everybody's into consciousness. Everybody's using the consciousness word. But basically, it put three things in my head all at the same time. One was that thing I talked about with the, the Canadians told in 1950. Mental phenomena is involved. And that is extremely important because in 1950, no matter what anybody says, there was nobody talking to aliens. The aliens did not appear until t a couple of days after the detonation of the of the hydrogen bomb, which we can destroy the world with. In 1952, Adamski and Williamson, that's the first public. Now, there may have been the odd guy who had some contact before, but it was not oh. public. And so th nobody knew anything. So how did the Americans know to tell the Canadians that mental phenomena was involved? They either had a craft and they realized it was conscious and, or they had a live alien that was talking right. in their head. So they knew this. Yeah. So that was put in my head. And these three things instantaneously. The second thing that came into my head instantaneously, at, as same as that, the, the, the whole idea of, of mental phenomena is involved, 1950, was this thing that Eric Walker cut us off in the middle of an interview. He said, look, let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? I had no idea until I watched that lecture by Colin Andrews, what he was talking about. And suddenly it's like, oh, that's what Walker's talking about. He's talking about the same thing the Canadians were talking about. And then the other one was Jan Harson goes the famous story. 1993, two years after Walker told us about ESP, Jan Harson uh, is, at, is watching Ben Rich give a lecture at, at UCLA. And Ben Rich is talking about Lockheed Skunk Works. And, and he makes this joke at the end. We've got the technology at EET home. And Jan Hartson had an experience at nine years old with his flying saucer in the backyard. And he's fascinated his whole life. He wants propulsion. He wants to build a flying saucer. Him and his brother, he goes to Ben. He said, Ben, I need to know, how do they get here? How does it work? I've wanted to build a flying saucer my whole life. How do they get here? How does the propulsion system work? And Ben turns around. And he says, exactly what Walker said two years before. Let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? And then Jan says, uh, it means everything in time and space is connected. And he said, that's how it works, and walks, walks out of the building. So that was the first download I got. It was like, this is consciousness. This is how it works. For two days, I could not think. It was like, oh, I, I couldn't believe it. It was like, because I'd look for the answer. What was that thing I'd seen in 1975? Somebody has to have the answer. Suddenly, I had the answer. I'd been given it in a download. The next download I had was much more complex. It was 2017. And these are like, I call they're noetic experiences. Edgar Mitchell gave that term. It comes with absolute certainty. It's not like a good idea. It's like you're talking to God. You're given this information and this is how it works. 2017, I'm walking. I, I, I can get these downloads by walking. So I walk, walk, walk. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm zoning out, whatever. And then suddenly something will come in my head. I'm walking a six mile walk, going downtown into the city and I'm walking along. It's cold. And all of a sudden, it starts to come into my head. And I go, get a piece of paper, get a pen. I start writing, take my glove off. And I'm writing this stuff coming into my head. Boom, 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 this stuff's coming. And and there's 24 things that came into my head. It came back 15, I stopped. And then I go, oh, okay. And then it sort of went away. And then I started walking in and it started to come again. Grab the paper, grab the pen, start writing again, take the glove off. And what it basically told me, the download in 2017 said what I've gotten numerous times since. Not only do we not know what's going on, it is exactly the opposite of what you think it is. It's everything. So it said, yeah, yeah, it was yeah, saying to yeah. me, it, it said to me, okay, it is the world made out of little nuts and bolts. If it is, that's one world. But if the world is made out of consciousness, that's a completely different world with completely different rules. Is it yeah. one life? If it's one life, that's one world with certain rules. But if it's multiple lives, that's a completely different world. If it's a random world, then that's one world with certain rules. But if it's pattern, if it's not random, it's pattern. And it was saying, it's not this, it's this. It's exactly the opposite. And if these 24 things, you got this wrong, you got this wrong, you got this wrong. And then in later experiences, I actually it actually said to me at one point, it said to me this following expression, which people can't believe. I actually was talking to a force and it said to me, it said, you are an ignorant, arrogant little piece of, if you fill in the blank, you think you understand how reality works. You have not got a clue. And the worst part about it is you're an ignorant, arrogant little piece of fill in the blank You and uh, that thinks he understands how reality works and you haven't got a clue. You tell me that's not true. 
That's what I was told, clear as day. And that's the whole thing is we don't have an idea. We have no idea how this technology works. That's what they're covering up in, in a large degree. There are people who know. I mentioned this fact that Kit Green had had this. Um, he has an intuitive. They're using intuitives. So this program by Bob Bigelow, they're using an intuitive. Her name is Kay Randall May. She's considered to be the top intuitive in the United States. Kit Green said she's better than Yuri Geller, 95% accurate on all the medical. There was a tape that leaked out, which I'm going to put on the internet. Uh, a lot of people have seen the transcript, but this, this happened in 2017. And he's saying, who are we dealing with? And this intuitive says, there's a portal off the coast of California, and there are beings and there are um, uh, people on this ship and they have come to talk they have come to warn us about a geological instability and that was the same thing the canadians were told in the 1950s that yes. the beings were oh, off right. the coast of california fixing fault lines and that was before yeah. we knew about plate tectonics so that there is absolutely spot on grant they are fixing fault lines it's something i don't talk about you you're absolutely yeah. bang on with that yeah and, and, the, and the interesting thing is in the 1950s, we have a, an FBI document that shows this thing that AFA can't come to the meeting because he's busy fixing fault lines. And we did not know. I remember in 1970s when I was going to university, wow. it was still a theory there. The idea that there was plate tectonics was still like, ah, this is got maybe a garbage theory. Away. We didn't know. So how would they know in 1950 that there was these fault lines? So th there is this interaction, this this intuitive. So the, the government is using these intuitives, but Kit Green is the key guy who says, and in fact, Jacques Vallée was talking. If you read Jacques Vallée's uh, fourth book, uh, Forbidden uh, Science, there's a lot of stuff. He's talking to Kit Green, and he's saying, we haven't got a clue. We haven't got a clue how this thing works. We've got this technology. And he said, but you over there, because Kit Green is a ph physiologist, you've got the, the body technology. You probably got you probably got more information. And Kit Green says, well, perhaps the body thing is as much a dead end as the physical stuff. So they're giving us this stuff. They have a body. They definitely have at least one body, but they may be not be able to figure out anything with the body either. It's way beyond what we have because it involves this consciousness. And I don't care what anybody says. As long as you're doing weapons and stuff like that, you do not understand consciousness. Consciousness is the idea of oneness. It's all one thing. All Everything in time and space, they're not coming from anywhere. They are here. They are here. It's all dimensional. They're moving. And Kit Green actually says that. He t tells oh, Penison. He, he talks about the yeah. interdimensional. It's, it's yeah. this idea that we've got it completely mixed up. We have no idea what's going on. We're making a bunch of assumptions, and they're all wrong. What I was told in one intuitive download is it's called wrong blocks. It's like you have this block. The world is flat. No, it's not. The sun goes around the earth. No, it's not. We're the center of the earth. No, it's not. And we got wrong block, wrong block, wrong block. And what Einstein said, with this wrong block thing is Einstein said, you cannot solve a problem, Tony, using the same information that you use to create the problem. You mm -hmm. need a new information. We're taking, or, or as, as William James said, you think you're thinking and all you're doing is rearranging your prejudices. We're taking these wrong blocks and we're shuffling these wrong blocks around and you're never going to get the answer because you've got the wrong blocks. You've got to, as you've got to realize the world ain't flat. We're not the center of the universe. Things are not solid and, and we're learning more and more. We're getting, but we're always in the ego state where we think we're at the very verge we got one more thing and we've got this thing all figured out like max Planck, who's professor the head of quantum physics the godfather of quantum physics his professor told him in 1874 do not go into physics we got it all figured out already that's the problem we have this ego thing that we got this thing all figured out and as i was told you have not got a clue what's going on you oh, think no. you know what's going on you don't yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that they would. I think that to, to keep this all quiet, um, that what bothers me is the secrecy around it, and it is nefarious because I, I believe I believe there is an alien cold war among them. So you've got the consciousness going on, but on one side, for example, you've got Greys, and on the other side, you've got a Nordic situation going on, and they are continually colliding over something, uh, which I which I find quite mysterious. I mean, for example, Grant. What's your take on the alien invasion narrative being played on CNN and the mainstream media in America at the moment? Well, I, I say that that's um, – I don't believe in evil aliens. I don't believe in any of that kind of stuff. I, I basically say it's all us, us manifesting, and the reason that's being put out is that um, if you're going to go to the Senate – this is what they're doing right now. They're going to the Senate, yeah. and they want financing. 
So yeah. unless you have a threat, because if you go back to uh, the days of Hillary Clinton and John Podesta, and and the, the key figure there was Leslie Kane. And Leslie mm-hmm. Kane, if you read her book, she's putting out the thing that we need to do some of the UFOs because they may run into airlines, <laughs> airliners. And I guess the government went, that get out of here. Like, but if you go in there and you say, oh, there's this threat, and they could they could come and eat us or whatever the scenario mm-hmm. is, then you're going to get some money. But unless you, and John. John Alexander said the same thing. We did it in the 1980s. He ran a program. And he said, you've got to do the threat thing. Otherwise, you're not going to get any money. You've got to sell Congress on the fact that, that this, this thing has to be solved. And, and uh, so that, I think, is the, what they're, they're doing. And they're, they're playing this, this scenario. I don't think they, they really have any clue in terms of, of, of what's going on. In fact, a lot of it is the surrender thing. That when you see these experiences off the coast of uh, Florida, where the UFO is coming in really, really close to the plane, that's the whole scenario that I think people got to be very careful of. Is if you think you're going to take on this phenomenon, you're going to shoot this phenomena down. Make sure your life life insurance is paid up, and make sure oh, your yeah. will is ready because it's it's going to be game over. And that's why they came so close to the planes. They came these balls inside of cubes. They came within inches of the plane, and it yeah. said, "We're running the show here, folks." Yeah. You you better surrender. You better you, all this war crap and fighting and stuff. We've had enough of this nonsense. And th- they're saying, and I, I tell the story. I I've got access to the Stanton Friedman files. I went to the Stanton Friedman files. One of the things I was looking for in those files that I knew existed was the whole Cuban story. And if you've heard the Cuban story from nineteen sixty seven, please please tell the listeners, Grant, Cuban story. You go for it. Go. Stan Stan was involved in this. What happened was um, the Cubans had a UFO coming wow. in over the coast of Cuba. And yeah. this was being monitored by a Navy station in Florida. Uh, they were monitoring all their Cuban communications. It was picked up like the NSA. They, they intercepted this communication. So these yeah. two planes are scrambled to go and get this UFO. And they, they tell the UFO to, to back off, to land, all the, you know, this, the stuff they always give, whatever. And the UFO just keeps coming. And then the, the Americans are sitting there listening on this channel. And the, the wingman is, is describing, and we've got it locked on. We're going to take it down. Take it down. And then the wingman goes, oh, my God, it's gone. And he says, the plane is gone. The, the front guy who locked on just disintegrated, just gone like that. And they picked this whole thing up. And so um, it went and the National Enquirer got involved. They filed an FOIA on this thing. And they were trying to get information on this thing. And, uh, of course, NSA wouldn't talk. And the one guy went to NSA and he said, you either give me the information or I'm going to the Cubans to get the information of, of what happened in this situation. And that afternoon, two FBI guys showed up at his door and scared the living daylights out of him. And he backed off the story. And that's the whole thing is this phenomena is running the show. And we think that we're going to take it down. We're going to shoot it down or whatever. It is basically um, teaching us lessons. It's in control. And I think part of the, the cover up, we're talking about cover up. I, what I say, the cover up, I write about this. The cover up, a lot of it is, has to do with the fact they have they have not got a clue. And if you're the president of the United States or the intelligence, you're not going to say, oh, well, there's this thing here and they're flying around and there's nothing we can do about it. And we've tried to shoot it down and it shoots us down and stuff like that. And the other thing that people don't realize, I, I know all these high level people and I know I talked to the one guy who did the invention. He yeah. was given information. He was given information, medical material from the beings. He's got 40 different patents. And he told me, because he knew he was into downloads. I had this conversation with him. Who, and who was said, that, uh, Grants? Who is that? Or this is Tyler, Tyler, Tyler D., who's in the um, Diane Pasolka book. He's the NASA guy. He's the head NASA guy for UFOs. Was brought in by the Black Ops people. Uh, is an experiencer himself. And he said, he said, you know that invention I got? That, he had this invention. A medical invention was given to him which I really don't want to talk about, but he, he said they tried to get it on that, on the, the space shuttle and they would not sign off. They said, that's not going to work. This is garbage. You're not going to put this on the space shuttle. And he got a scientist to sign off for this thing. He got on a space shuttle. It worked. And this thing was sold. I won't say what the figure is, but it's more money than you could ever imagine with, for this company that sold it. That's what you got to realize, that part of the cover-up is the people who have a little bit of like, this little piece of information or that little piece of information are not going to tell you and me because you may have the other piece of the puzzle and you're going to go oh, patent absolutely. it. There's a lot of money involved in this. So if you're sitting on the inside, you say, oh, this is the invisible college. We can't come forward. We're, we're, you know, we got reputations. We're professors, whatever. No, they're sitting in the background and everybody's got patents. You want to file patents. You want to figure out how this thing works and file the patents before you make it public. 
That's part of the cover-up is that everybody's in their own self-interest. There's only three rules in the United States of America. Number one rule is money. Number two rule is money. Number three rule is money. It's all about money. It's about controlling really, information, really getting the technology. And the, the aliens have actually told us, if you're into technology, you are in a lot of trouble. It's got nothing to do with technology. It's got them saying to us that we're in a situation now where it's me versus you, good versus bad. We're all fighting with each other. You can't pass a budget. Everybody's at war. And unless you guys get on your knees and get humble and realize that we are all one, we are in this world, unless you understand that, we're taking you out. It's over. People, there's 39% of people who are experiencers who are on the board the ship and are shown the screen and are shown these things. Unless you turn this around, unless you get together and work as one, you are gone. And what the aliens told the Canadians in 1950 is this whole thing about the nuclear weapons. If there's a nuclear exchange, we will step in. Otherwise, we will never interfere. We will allow the human race to stew in its own juices. My bottom line is they are here to save the planet. They are here to stop us from using nuclear weapons. They are here to save the planet. They could care less about us. If we take ourselves out, it's a reincarnation world. You're coming back to learn your lesson someplace else. So it really doesn't matter what we do. They don't really care about us. They, 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 they're giving us the warnings. But if we decide that we're going to cut our throats and we're going to blow up the, and we're going to kill ourselves through uh, environmental things or whatever we do, that's fine. That's your free will. That's what you're going to do. You're just not going to blow up the planet. That's what bottom line from what I've seen in 46 years of what the message is that they're here to give us the warnings about oneness. It's all about the fact that we're all sparks of the divine. We're all part of one thing, and the idea that we are all that we're all separate, that's me versus you, as long as it's like that, it's going to be constant war and it's getting worse and it's getting worse and the divisions are getting worse between countries and between even political parties where you can't do anything. Everybody's at war with everybody else and it's game over unless we get the understanding of oneness. That's what they're telling us. Yes, they're doing it for the children of men, aren't they? They are. Do you have access then to Robert Bigelow, uh, Grant, as a matter of interest? Uh, no, no. I, I I dealt with NIDS quite a bit when he was running NIDS. I was interacting right. with uh, some of the people in NIDS, but they sort of cut me off because I've got a big mouth. And they, it's like they said, at one point they said, oh, Cameron is, can't follow the code of ethics. And it's like, code of ethics? <laughs> it's, like these, it's like secret. I called it MJ-12 2.0. It's like you have this level of secrecy up at the government. And then you have these second level of guys who know what's going on. And mm -hmm. it's like, we keep these secrets. We're, we got these secrets. And it's like, what does it help the world? If you and I figure this thing out and we don't tell the world, it's just another level of secrecy. You've got to tell the world. So I got cut off because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I said, what is the point? You guys have this stuff people need to know what the answer is and i, I, I may be wrong but i'm going to tell people what i think I, I is think, going on yeah exactly i think grant that your comp you haven't got a big gob on you your compassion when you know as do i that that the the, the 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 ufo phenomena is about consciousness then you're on the then you're on the right track and i can see that your compassion is is just clearly evident my question to you the further question i wanted to ask you is during the course of your of the books that you've written, I'd love would I'd like to get into the presidential UFO stuff for the listeners. But during the course of these books that you've written and the fact that you're you've been digging around, have you come across the so called men in black keep quiet grant or we're gonna do you in type of behaviour? Have you come across that kind of recoil during your research? Oh absolutely. Uh, have see you? I have a Oh, yeah, I, sure. I have a thing called the theory of wow, where I think that it's all got to do with the theory of wow. They're not doing anything. They're just sending messages. So they do these weird things. Like, it's the idea. Why do UFOs jump around in the sky? Oh, yeah. Because they know you're watching. <laughs> they yeah. watch you. You go, wow, what the hell's going on here? And, and the more you think about what's going on, the more you're going to work to figure out how reality works or dropping the medals. And that's why they do the, the, um, the, the whole thing with the men in black. It's like, it's got to be weird. I said to Linda Howe, why do they take the blood out of the cows when they mutilate the cows? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's because if they don't take the blood out, you're not going to think it's weird enough. It's got to be really weird. So they do this really weird stuff. I'll give you an example. I deal with a guy by name of Tony. You probably you may know him from London. And Tony, um, we had a couple of experiences together. And he does all this photographing um, uh, stuff there. And um, I lost my train of thought. So, um Oh, yeah, he had the thing where he, he shows me these photographs of these helicopters. And you hear this thing with, like, men in black, and you have the helicopters. Like, everybody's got the helicopters, and you're going, like, is this the government? Like, how does the government know the very next morning? And, and, and so then Tony shows me this photograph with a helicopter with a UFO in it. 
And I go, that's pretty cool. And he said, well, I've got another one. He shows me another one, low flying helicopter, maybe 75 feet over, over his head. And they're all different. Like one's a police helicopter, one's this kind of helicopter. And you're wondering like, what, what's going on here? And then, so I put it on the internet and people started sending me all these photographs with black helicopters that followed them the next morning with a UFO in them. And then you got to, it's like the, the old deal. You got to say, give your head a shake. What is really going on? Is this a black helicopter? Is this the government? Or is this them playing the game? They want you to feel important. They want you to wonder what's going on. And, and I said, is there anybody who's got a low flying helicopter that doesn't have a UFO in it? Like what's the chances you're going to have a low flying helicopter over you, over you after the morning you have an experience that has a UFO in it? It's this game thing. That's why they're dropping the metals and they're, they're changing the isotopes because people are, are, are going crazy. They're, they're, that's why they do crop circles. Why would they do crop circles? You can't figure it out. But everybody's going like, what is going on here? Like, and I call it the theory of wow. And, I, and in the end, I think the more I look at it, the more it's like, no, they're just doing this weird stuff where they're trying to get your attention. They're trying to get you to figure it out because they're not here to do our homework. They're not going to sit, land on the White House lawn and tell us what's going on. They want us to figure it out because as, as long as they tell us, we're not going to listen. It's when you figure it out for yourself, that's when you believe. That's when you go forward with it. And that's what I think all the, all the phenomena is turns out to me to be this theory of wow. So the men in black stuff is like really weird. Or why did they do the, the I, I tell the story with Chris Bledsoe with a lot of people. You have the shadow people. The shadow. So Chris Bless has these shadow people in his house, and and you hear that all the time. So I said, "Hey, Chris, did you see the shadow guy with the hat?" And he goes, "Yeah, I saw that guy." And it's like it's a shadow person. Why does it need a hat? Come on, give your head a shake. This is not what you think it is. Or like the Betty and Barney Hill. The Betty. Everybody has this thing about the Betty and Barney Hill thing. They oh they did this and they just sort of go along with the story. And it's like, do you not realize they had baseball hats on? They had hats on. Like what do you got a you got a baseball team on Zeta Reticuli? Take a close look. It's not what you think it is. Or I say to people, like people, they're on board the ship and they say, uh, you know, uh, this. And people will ask the question. They'll say, hey, did they, did you scared? Did they probe you? Did it hurt? They get all these fear questions. I do exactly the opposite. I, I say to them, hey, you saw the, you saw the being on board the ship? Let me ask you a question. Yeah, what? Uh, did, did it, uh, did it have any clothes on? And they go, uh, no, come to think of it. No, it didn't have any clothes on. I said, don't you think that was kind of strange? Yeah, it is kind of weird. And I said, did it have any sex organs on it? It's a human, it's, like it's supposed to be a flesh and blood being. Does it have any sex organs? And they go, no, come to think of it. No, it didn't have any sex organs. Do you have a belly button? If you look at the alien autopsy thing, do you have a belly button? No. Do you have a nipples? No. And and then I say, you know, this this thing. I said, did you ever ask it if it was an alien? So <laughs> it's Sherry Wild, who's very famous, who wrote the book, The Forgotten Promise. I said to her, Sherry, did you ever ask, da, if it was an alien? She said, yeah, I did. And I said, well, what did he say? He said, da, I said, no, not really. And she said, no, well, why do you come as this ugly looking gray thing? And he said, ugly looking gray thing. And they have this discussion about what he looks like. And, and, uh, Yossi Ronan, same thing. They, the being said, we don't have to look like this. We can look at it like whatever we want. And it's this whole thing that we're, we're sort of playing into the scenario and we don't realize it's not what we think it is. We think, oh, it's this, uh, alien stuff. Or I said the thing, Betty Andreessen, who's the most famous contactee of all times, 1946, her and her husband. Sorry, her what was name? Sorry, what was that name, Grant? Uh, Betty Andreessen, Betty Luca. Yeah. So her and her husband had they written six books, and they have the thing with the one. She gets in contact with the one. They yeah. take her, the being takes her to this, the god or the one or whatever. And anyway, so I'm talking to her husband, and he's talking about this, the same thing. The men in black, they're following his computer, they're they're monitoring his computer and stuff. I said, well, is Betty got uh, plans to how the ship flies? She said, well, yeah, she got all these models and how the thing. I said, well, would you be surprised? That they're following you, of course they're going to follow her. She's got, she's in contact with aliens, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. So of course they're going to monitor your computers. But they had this thing about the being. So I said to to Bob Luke, I said, okay, you saw the being in 1946. Yeah, now you're like 80 years old. And I said, did the being ever get any older? And he went, no. But beings get, uh, beings get, uh, aliens live a long time. You ask everybody, almost everybody says the same thing. Did the alien ever get any older? And they go. Oh, no, not really. And it's like, does that not make some, make you wonder like what's going on? The, the hybrids get older, but the beings themselves, or people will say, like Chris Bledsoe, when was the first time you, when he was under regression by uh, the John Max associate at Harvard, uh, Michael O'Connor? Michael O'Connor says, when did you first encounter these beings? He said, they've been with me since before I was born. John Mack has the one. When was the time, last time you saw the being? Oh, he was with me in my last lifetime. And you start going like, this is a little more complex. So what I say in the end, I say, this phenomena is going to be a lot less physical than people think it is. 
It's going to be a lot more spiritual than people think it is. Tony Topping has lived a secret double life involving UFOs and close encounters with aliens. I, Alien, The Secret UFO Chronicles, tells of his 40 years of experiences with the world of paranormal espionage and UFOs. The current situation has led to a type of alien cold war in the skies above by forces unknown to the human world. And the formation of a secret communication network not governed by time. The warning from aliens against human conflict is very real. With art inspired by his close encounters, I, Alien, The Secret UFO Chronicles. It is, it is go- it's going to be a thousand times more complex than people think it is, and it will not have a hint of capitalism. I'll yeah. guarantee it. All those yes, things. Indeed. Uh, it would be, it's a security concern that some of these civilizations are not using money. Uh, as their main oh, yeah. foundation, and that is a security concern. And I, I'm fascinated to note, Grant, uh, th- th- this is a fascinating interview. I, I just Could you tell the listeners about how you – this surprised me that I didn't really know you until I started looking at your material, but could you tell the listeners uh, as to how the, the book Contact Modalities was born, um, why you went down that route, and what did you discover, and what was it all about? Okay, well, I had, as I mentioned, I had the download experience. So when I had the download experience in 2012, I thought, this is unreal. And so I started looking at downloads. That's when I realized that Paul McCartney had written a song yesterday, came to him in a dream. And I, all these musicians that got download songs, and, and I realized that, you know, the hologram and the laser, all these things came when the guy was sitting on a park bench. Uh, Einstein got his uh, theory of relativity in a dream, the toboggan dream. Uh, the qu- quantum atom came to Niels Bohr in a dream, a horse track dream, where they're showing him the horse track. And I realized that all these people are getting these download things. And so I got very interested in the whole download. How do you get in the field? And the idea, like 40% of all experiencers say at one point during their experience, they knew the answer to everything in the universe, which indicates that everything is there. All the answers are there. And it's the ability to access the field, the Akashic record, whatever you want to call it, to get in the field and get it. So that was the whole idea of contact modality. So what happened was I'd had this contact and Ray Hernandez, who has the Free Foundation, the Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation, that looks at 3,000 experiencers. He had this, his wife was having these experiences, the dog gets healed. I won't get into all that. But he, he, he's, he's an atheist. He's, he's, you know, an RS attorney, uh, real straight guy. And he said, okay, uh, my wife's having these experiences with these flying saucers. I want to see one of these things. So he goes outside and he's waiting for some guy to bring some papers to him. And he said, okay, I want to see the UFOs. That, the thing that my wife was talking about, the stained glass windows, nothing happens. 15 minutes later, he looks up and he looks at the Wembley Stadium over the next door neighbor's house. And he freaks out. He brings his daughter out there. And he suddenly realizes you can actually bring these things in. You can actually contact. So he goes on the internet and he, he, he posts in the internet he puts in uh consciousness and ufos and of course my name pops up so he contacts me says i can contact these things i need to know what's going on uh, I, i'm going nuts here like i and and so i say well, i'm going to be in florida and you see these synchronicity things i say i'm going to be in florida i'm giving a lecture on consciousness you can come he lives in florida and we'll talk about it and maybe that'll help you so he comes to the lecture and he tells his whole story with his wife and their experiences whatever and he's all wound up wound up and stuff and then he goes back and two days later he's on the on the miami freeway in a traffic jam he's listening to npr radio and suddenly he's out of his body and he's up in a, in a whatever realm okay. and they're showing him a wheel and on the wheel has all these these visions and there's uh, quantum physics there's ufos there's remote viewing, there's uh, 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 channeling, uh, all this kind of stuff. And it, this wheel is moving around and in the middle is consciousness. And the beings say to him, you have to quit parsing it. It's all the same thing. It's all consciousness. All these things w- where you're fighting with the, the experiencers and the channelers or whatever, it's all the same thing. It's just different things. And he that's where he came up with the idea of contact modalities. It's all these different modalities, but it's all the same thing. And so that's he wanted me to write an article. And that's when I decided that, um, I had had contact experiences, various ways that I had gotten in the field and pulled material and had these ideas about, you know, mus- musicians and inventors and Nobel Prizes that came in these, these experiences. 
So I was going to write an article for him, and I really didn't know how to get going the article. So I said, okay, I'll write down the contact modalities, and then I'll, that'll get me going on the article that they wanted me to do for their book. And that's when I figured there were 70 different modalities. So it's like, uh, whatever. It's like card reading, tarot card reading, channeling, mediumship, or whatever. And and basically, it's all it's it's all the same thing. It's what Bashar, the famous alien channeler, calls. It's a permission slip. Whatever works for you, go for it. It's all the same thing. And then there are like musicians. So there are people who can play music, and then there are professional musicians. So it's because you're a channeler or a medium doesn't mean everybody's the same. Some people are good at it, and some people are really good at it. And that's the whole thing. There's a field. All the information is in the field, and there's all these different modalities. And so in the book, I go through all the different modalities, and I talk about how people are able to get in the field. And you can pick one of them and work on it, and everybody can get in. All the information is in the field, and it's the ability. All the memory is perfect. It's the ability to access the memory and to access the information in the field. And that's what people like Tesla were doing and people like that, where they were able to get in the field, get the information, get the invention, bring it back into the physical world. So saying that, Grant, you've had contact with aliens then, have you? No, mine is my contact is I, I don't I, I think it's all the same thing. So I'm not I'm not going to parse it and say this is aliens. This is this. It's all the same thing. Mm-hmm. What I'm what I'm interacting with is what. I describe it as a field. It's a sense that this thing is there. It, it, sometimes it feels it's like it's, it's like sometimes it says, it says we. Sometimes it's a female. Sometimes it's a male. It's always awe inspiring. Yeah. It's very powerful. It yeah. is it knows everything, and I know it. As soon as I run into it in an experience, I go, "Oh, there you are!" And it's like I've known this thing all along, and that's where I'm getting this stuff is through this field. Now, yeah. it, it may be interpreted as an alien. So people may get the alien or higher self, and that's the whole thing. It's 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 our it's our. If you're religious, you're going to see it as an angel. An angel is going to come give you the message. If you believe in aliens, and that's the thing. If you look back in, in 1896, the aliens were flying around in wooden ships with propellers and big giant lights, and they wore weird looking clothes, and they said they were from Mars. The story just keeps changing. They're changing the thing based upon your belief. So now we're in the space age. Now they're aliens. They used to be fairies. They used to be this kind of stuff. I say it's all the same thing. And what we believe is how we see the thing. The message is always going to be real, but it, how we interpret the message is based upon our belief system. So if you're in, in, the, in the West, you're going to see it as a Westerner. If you're in China, you're not going to see it the same way. If you're in Russia, you're going to see it different. It's based upon your 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 pattern. That's what the aliens actually told the Barbara Streisand's stepson is an experiencer. That's what they said to him. When we come to you, we go into your brain. And we use what's in your brain to create an experience. We have no other choice. We can't bring in stuff that's not in your brain. We just take what's in your brain and use it to give you an experience. So that's what they're they're doing. We are part. People want to separate it. They want to do the separation. There's a, a independent uh, situation. There's there's aliens out there, and then there's us. No, we're all the same thing. We're all connected. And when you realize that, that's when you make the the step forward. It's an information matrix, Grant, isn't it? And Grant, you've written you've written um, books. Uh, the listeners will be fascinated if they're not familiar with the work of Grant Cameron. He's written quite a few books. I want to get into now, Grant, if I may, with you the the what you faced uh, in researching the presidential UFO side of things and what you came across. Please tell us about that. Well, that was the idea that Walker, we had gone from the Canadian government to this president of Penn State University, and he had a file, he was keeping a file on us, and he was playing these little word games and sending us weird messages and stuff like that, and indirectly telling us what was going on, and basically saying, you're up against the windmills, leave it alone, you're never going to figure this thing out, Uh, you're wasting your time and stuff. And then he had been uh, executive director of the Research and Development Board, which is the U.S. department that does all the weapons in 1950 and he was going to give those files to the truman library and of course you got to remember i'm sitting there trying to figure out what's the answer what what, what was that thing i saw in 1975 i'm trying to figure out i need an answer what somebody needs to know what's going on and so i went to the truman library to get walker's files from this uh, 1950 period hoping that walker would have talked about ufos and what's what's actually going on and when i got there that's when it occurred to me i said oh well the president's the most powerful guy in the world I mean, he's got to know what's going on. Surely the president knows. So I said to the, the archivist, I said, and archivists, are, they're not covering up. They're just guys that are really interested in, in the president. So I said to them, I said, hey, so what do you got on UFOs? 
and so they did their search and they they pulled all the the um equip, all the stuff from the 1952 overflight of Washington D.C. and this is the the whole deal where you know we we give the shoot down order we, week one they appeared over the White House and the the Congress and then Truman gave the shoot down order and uh, all these telegrams came into the White House saying please Mr. President don't shoot him down and then there was the story about uh, uh, Einstein Einstein said Mr. President any intelligence that can come across millions of miles of space will know what to do once they get here don't start something you can't finish and and so there was all these these telegrams but that's all they had and i said that's all you got is these telegrams and they said no that's all we got and i'm thinking wow this is kind of weird the president it has to be a topic they discussed and so the, down the road from there a couple of my, maybe a couple hours down the road is the eisenhower library so i went to the eisenhower library and i said no oh, what do you got on ufos and they got five documents and i said that's it and the one was the Robertson panel report was in there. And I said, you got five documents. So how many pages of documents do you have? He said, 28 million pages. And I go, you only got five UFO documents. This is the most important subject in the world. And it's, and then it was like, something's wrong here. So I went to almost every presidential library looking for the UFO files. Wow. And they're basically the end, end story was there was none only in the, in the, in the, the Clinton administration, there was a lot of files because the Clintons were very interested in the thing, but otherwise there was none. And it was a subject that they really didn't put on paper. Even uh, um, if you hear the story that Truman in 1948 brings in his air advisor, uh, General Landry, and he said, you're my air advisor. And what I need you to do is give me a briefing, an oral briefing on UFOs every three months. So in 1948, they already knew it's an oral briefing. Do not put it on paper. So there are no files. The only thing that was very interesting was the alien invasion thing. And that's the oneness thing that Ronald Reagan. Exactly. Put in Sorry Shirley. to interrupt you, Grant. May I just come in? Where does this stand, what you're telling here about the don't shoot them down? Where does it stand in the, in the narrative in terms of Frank Faschino and his book, Shoot Them Down, the 1950s UFO air war? Um, do we know where we stand with that then from your view? Well, well, that's what I said to Cuban. That's why I keep warning people about the Cuban story. Right. Is if you think you're going to shoot these down, make sure your will is done and make sure your life insurance is paid up because it's going to be really ugly. And that's the thing. And according, I think George Knapp actually said that when he had the engagements with the Russians, the yeah. generals and the Russians, that the Russian military is told, do not engage. Oh, absolutely. You're not going to win. They, oh. they can shut the nuclear missiles down. In fact, yeah. they had this whole story. They're doing yeah. this theory. Of, wow, they're getting a message. So what they do in Russia is they actually let the missile count down. And they're going, oh, my God, the thing's counting down. And it's like, you know, it's going down. Five, four, three, two, one. They're trying to shut it off. They can't shut it off. And it goes, missiles uh, missiles launched. <laughs> and they call the headquarters. They go, we just started World War Three. We just launched the missile. We couldn't turn it off. And they said, what do you mean? There's nothing launched. And, and it's like, you can just see the, the beings, whoever's the, the intelligence or the aliens or whatever, just laughing like, oh, that's pretty funny. And it's like, that's what they do. They want to get the message across. So the whole, the whole thing is, if you think you're going to shoot them down, get ready because it is not going to happen. That's, that's military bravado. Oh, we can shoot them down. Again, we're flying these things. Okay. If I may just come in again on that, but just so that the readers know, uh, the listeners, sorry, no. In the 1950s, uh, there was a huge, ginormous incident flap going on, according to Timothy Good and research I've read, that the U.S. that the U.S. Air Force were using, uh, my word, Starfire, Starfire fighter jets to shoot down UFOs in rocket battle with 12 salvo. Um, and the, in Frank Faschino's book, the the Korean air races have said that they were being attacked by them, um, and that there was there was actually in the Washington Post an increase in adverts. Uh, for recruitment into anti-aircraft batteries, I, I'm just wondering how is that connected with the uh, with the Cuban stuff, and were you aware of that? I think is my question. Well, we've always tried to do this. We've always seen it as an enemy, so we're going to shoot it down. We're going to take it down. It's you know, it's in our airspace, yeah. and and we, you you take a look at how the reality works. Nobody right. owns the airspace. True. We're here for a short time. We're just yeah. here to take care of the airspace, and basically, so that's why I show with the Nimitz. So you take the Nimitz thing. Where yeah. they 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 engage the oh, Nimitz yeah. carrier yeah. and oh, yeah. and they they're there for a week. They're often on the radar for a week, and then suddenly they decide they're going to chase it. They get the F-18s. We're going to go chase this thing, and I can just see the 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 beings. They're going, oh, here they come! Finally, they're coming. Okay, get ready. Here they come, and and then they tell uh, Zogar, Zogar, go under the water. Make make some bubbles under the water. Make big giant <laughs> bubbles. They're coming, and then the fighter goes, holy cow! There's some under the water. There's big bubbles, and and they're doing this thing, and the same as the engagement with the off the coast of Florida, where they come yeah. within inches of the plane, and they're yeah. basically saying, hey. We were here first. 
this is our airspace. Play nice in the airspace or we're going to take you out. And that's the message. That's why they're engaging the U.S. military. It's $730 billion defense budget, and it's based on national insecurity. It's like everybody's an enemy. We're going to kill people. We're going to do this kind of stuff. And the beings have had it with this garbage. They're saying, we're engaging. That's why there's so many engagements with the military. They're yeah. they're putting a post in the ground and they're saying enough is enough. And 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 we got the same sort of thing. Oh, we're going to shoot them down. We're going to do this kind of stuff. And that's what the Fraschino thing shows is that you think you're going to show them down. Take a look at the early 1950s. A lot of people are about to die. Don't be stupid. Keep the, the the ego out of it. But that's what we have is everybody's a threat. We're the top of the world. We're the smartest guys. And these are threats. And we're going to take them out just like we took out every other country in the world. We've killed millions of people. And we're going to take these on. Or even they asked Bill Clinton. He said, oh, if there was an alien invasion, do you think that we would win? And he said, yeah, I think we'd come together and we'd win. Yeah, give your head a shake. This thing is so far beyond us. We have to, as, a, as the message I was True. given last night said, True. you better get on your knees and start being humble or we're taking you out we've had enough of the ego we've had enough of me me i i i this is this has gone too far you're going to take and, and basically if this is not turned around that people on the to see the screen says the same thing if you do not turn this around you are gone it's it's all about oneness it's all about whether you're going to fight with each other and kill each other until the last uh, fish in the sea. People have this idea. I'm the smart guy. I can do whatever I want. Don't tell me what to do. If I'm smart enough to catch the last fish in the sea, I'm catching the last fish in the sea. If I'm the smartest guy to chop the last tree down, I'm chopping the last tree down. They're just objects. They don't have souls. Don't tell me what to do. And that's the problem that's going to kill us is everybody's fighting and the resources are getting eaten up and we're depleting the planet and we can't get anything past. We're fighting. We have in, in, in U.S. capital. We have, we have Americans against Americans. And I say to them, the reason the United States of America was such a great country because it's the United States of America. It is no longer the United States of America. It is doomed until you turn this. And I can't see them turning around. You can see it's collapsing in on itself. And it's got to do with the ego in belief and separation. Everything in the modern world that's considered to be evil is caused by one thing, one thing only, the mistaken belief in separation. Everything that is positive and good is the belief in oneness. Which as long as we believe that we are separate and these are enemies and we're going to kill these people and they're going to kill us, we're just going to keep killing each other until it's all over. And the aliens are just here to make sure that we don't blow up the world. Because Beautiful. what happens is Beautiful. it's all one thing. We, oh, it's like a bell. So when we detonate an atomic bomb, that's why they came here. It's a bell. It's all one thing. And when we detonate an atomic bomb, we say, oh, it doesn't affect anybody. It rang the bell. The entire universe knew that the kids had the matches. That's why they're here, because what we do affects the rest of the universe. We think nuclear weapons won't affect anything, and they say it affects everything in the universe, and we're shutting it down. We're not going to let you do it. You see, the thing with the nuclear stuff as well is that it may affect parallel universes. I know for, exactly. I, you know, I mean, there there is... It's a, it's a highly gray area, but there is humanity running in a parallel universe. And you would have thought, Grant, that the, the U.S. Navy, instead of going to defensive posturing when they turned up on scene near these UFOs, near their maritime base, what would have happened if they'd have opened hailing frequencies? They could have learnt a lot from them. But there again, if they'd acquisitioned the technology from them, they'd have only used it to design better killing machines. Um, well, yeah. And this, yeah, and this, this well, is quite me- a well, let me make a point on that because that's important because you hear Lou Elizondo and I've, I've hammered these guys and they get upset about it, about this fear thing. Lou Elizondo from T- just left TTSA. He's the main, he's the main guy who ran the ATIP program. And, right. and basically he's, he's on this thing. Well, it's not fear. That's my job. And that's, that's what's called the Nuremberg defense. How could you put people in the gas chamber? It was the easiest thing in the world. I just did my job. And so you have a bunch of military people who say, well, it may be wrong to be doing what we're doing, but that's my job. I'm here to defend the United States of America. I'm here to do weapons. And everybody's just using the Nuremberg defense. And that that is a very dangerous situation oh, that people just salute and, and do this thing because that national oh, security, national insecurity, the budget, that's what it's based upon. It's based upon fear. $700 billion is a lot of fear. There's all these people that are out to get us. We're the strongest country in the world. We're the United States of America. And everybody's picking on us. The Chinese are picking yeah. on us. And the, the British are picking yeah. on us. And we're these victims. And we're yeah. going to fight back. And, we're, yeah. and, and that's what's going to destroy the world. As the aliens have observed, Grant, we've got this, uh, as they said to you, you've got this technology to kill. 
but you ain't got the technology to solve the tsunami that might hit California or to yeah. solve the weather problems and disease problems that we face at the moment. It's all very nice. I'm sure they do, do a good job at TTSA. Uh, I think they've the, disbanded now, haven't they? But there wasn't one word on how education might be improved, how the homeless problem on the streets might be improved. It was all better mechanisms for killing. And it's a, yeah. a galactic embarrassment, frankly, um, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, it is. It's a, a galactic yeah. embarrassment. And and yeah. so the thing is, I wonder with Luis Elizondo, where do you think he's heading? Where is this, this narrative heading for? Have you got an idea as to where it might be heading for? Well, he he wants openness, so I give him that. He wants openness. He wants it out there. It's the underlying belief system. We want it. We want openness because this may be a threat. Yeah. And, and until you get off that, so he's he's busy doing a bunch of projects. Uh, he's very high profile. Uh, media will listen to him. They, they, I give TSA that credit. That yeah. TTSA did turn it around. That until the New York Times article appeared, we were the Rodney Dangerfield of the of the scientific world. I yeah. mean, we had no respect from anybody. But yeah. now it's like we people are listening to us. But yeah. you got to get the right message. And yeah. so I, I am I'm totally for TTSA. I'm totally for what they're doing, except for when they get into this idea about the um, the the threat. And that's what Tom DeLong said. He yeah. said this whole thing about the fact yeah. that uh, the 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 Greys may not have souls. And we need to swat some bugs out of the sky. We need. He talked about this detonation of an atomic bomb up in the atmosphere to bring down UFOs. And it's like, give your head a shake. And that's this whole belief. It's us versus them and this threat scenario. And and it's separation. And separation will destroy the world. That is the message I keep getting, yeah. is that until you realize we're all one, we've got to work together. But I don't yeah. see it happening. I absolutely you see the division is getting worse and worse and worse. Even now we're with this COVID thing with with Great Britain. We have all our, our vaccines coming out of Great Brit, uh, out of the Europe. And yeah. now Europe is going to put it as sort of stop the uh, because they don't believe they're getting enough. Yeah. So they're going to stop the vaccine from coming to Canada from from shipping it here. And that's the thing. So now all the countries are fighting over saving themselves. Getting the vaccine, it's like pushing all the women and children out of the way on the on the Titanic to be the first in the lifeboat. To hell with you, I'm saving myself, and that's what we're in. We're in this thing of yeah. me, me, spelling the team, I, 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 I. It's all about me. It's all about us, and and that's going to destroy the world. So that's uh, what I see. It, to me, it's pretty clear what they're doing, and it's all the same thing. Whether it's uh, whether it's uh, spirit beings or uh, aliens or a force or whatever it is, there's a message coming from the other side that is trying to help us. It's trying to get, but it can't do it for us. It's giving us these little cues and hints, and, and it's up to you and I, Tony, to get what we have and to put it out there, not to cover it up, to put it out there and let people see it. And the more you and I talk about it, the more we put books out, the more we do it, the more consciousness, because we are no different than any other social or political movement. We believe, oh, this is an important issue that the, the government, everybody should bow down because UFOs is such an important issue, and reality and all that kind of stuff. But it's no more important than childhood cancer. It's no important than gay rights or African-American rights. And all those uh, things, women's right to vote is an example. It was a lot of women who fought and, and brought it up. And it was started in 1840. And it didn't get their right to vote till 1920. It was a long overnight before they finally got the right to vote. The more we talk about it, the more the consciousness rises. And eventually everybody's going to say, oh, yeah, it's right. Women, women do have souls. It was believed back a couple hundred years ago that women didn't have souls. We're evolving and we have to get what is right, what is real. And if we've got the message, if we're in contact with this force on the other side that is giving us message, it is incumbent upon us to take that message and give it to the world, not to keep it to ourselves, not to try to make money from it, to put it out there. And the more we talk about it, the more the consciousness will rise. And eventually someone's going to figure it out. And hopefully that'll save the world. I, mean, I, I agree with you, Grant. And the thing is, I wonder, could I ask out of all the presidents you've researched, which president was the most perceptive to this argument that you've been putting forward about it being consciousness and all that kind of thing? Um, uh, well, the Clintons and Obama. Obama was extremely interested in it. And yet I always point out that um, there's been 14, now 15 administrations right. that have had to handle the UFO situation since uh, Roosevelt first had to handle it. And every single administration has done exactly the same thing, which indicates that whatever the reason is for the cover up, yeah. that um, the president believes it's constitutional 
believes they're doing the right thing. And sometimes we forget that. We think there's evil people in the government. Everybody thinks they're saving the world. Even the bad guys think they're saving the world. They think they're doing the right thing. So there's something deep inside. And I think that's where I go to this thing that it may be that they really don't understand enough. They don't want to put it out. Uh, but Obama was extremely interested in, in the thing. And Podesta had gone to him and Podesta talks about this, that he tried to talk Obama into it and Obama didn't want to go for it. But then they used this backdoor thing where they do this disclosure through the back door. So they say, we, we can't reveal it openly, but we're going to have these leaks. Um, there's something deep inside the government that is known. Like Obama was asked, they asked Obama a question just a couple of months ago. They said, did yeah. they ever withhold information from you? And there's always this idea that the president is, doesn't have a need to know. And I say, give your head a shake. The president, all security, top secret, secret, all that stuff, as all goes through the executive office of the president. He's in charge of security. He's in, he does not have a security clearance. He doesn't need it. He has access to anything he wants. So they asked Obama, were you withheld stuff? Because that was always the idea. Oh, they don't tell the president. They say, you don't need to know about UFOs. We're not going to tell you. We'll shoot you if you try to find out. And, and they asked Obama, were you withheld information? He said, no. I was never withheld information. And of course, he said, well, what about UFOs? And he said, no, I looked for it. And he talked about this deep inside the bowels of the Pentagon. It was very hard to get out. And I'm not going to talk about it. So that is this indication that he found out what was going on. And he agreed that it had to stay secret for whatever reason that he couldn't. But he did do the disclosure thing. I think that this whole thing, I, I wrote a book called um, uh, Managing Magic. Where I say it's it's not UFOs, it's yeah. magic. And they have this thing that yeah. they're trying to manage this story, which is magic. UFOs, paranormal phenomena, all this sort of stuff. And they're trying to manage it. And I brought that book out eight months before Tom DeLong went public. And I basically said, this is what's going to happen. They're going to drop this thing. There's high-level people are going to come public. Lou Elizondo, uh, Jim Semivan, Chris Mellon, all these people. I knew this like a year and a half yeah. before they went public. And, and they, yeah. they got delayed because Hillary lost the election. They had to delay the thing. And, and move it back. But they that's what they're doing. They're doing this gradual disclosure in the background through plausible deniability. They're telling us what's going on, and they're still afraid to drop the actual story. And I think that's got to do with the fact that it's so far beyond what we have. And if it involves consciousness, I asked TTSA, I asked Hell Put Off. Somebody asked Hell Put Off, is TTSA working on consciousness? And he said, no, they're not. If you're not working on consciousness, you do not. I don't care what you say. You do not understand what's going on. Because it's not, I've, I've looked at all the people who claimed it was anti-gravity. It was this, I've looked at all these people. Hell put offs looked at them. Hell put off said, I've got a graveyard of, of stuff that didn't work. It is, it's got nothing to do with that. Uh, or Ryan Pendolfi calls all they got techno scam, that these people are scamming people. They're making you think that they've got a flying saucer, that they're going to build a flying saucer. They're not. They're just trying to get money. It, it's got to do with portals. Even John Alexander it was one interview uh, he did with Gaia TV. They're coming out of the studio. They're walking across the parking lot. And John John Alexander ran NIDS. He was the sort of the head of the board of directors there at NIDS. And and he and he, the, the reporter asked him, he said, well, what about this UFO thing? And he said, he got really angry. And he said, look, it's not about the UFOs. It's about the portals. And that's the whole thing. It's all one no, thing. It's all here. It's, it's all in time, and, time and space. Everything's connected. Yeah. It, everybody's deceived by the, the UFOs. They think it's out there. They're flying around. And, and that's the whole thing with the, the lights in the sky and the dropping of the metals. They're just trying to get our attention. It's all here and now. They're trying to wake us up. And we are waking up. We've yeah. discovered the consciousness part of it. But TTSA isn't. They're still into the technology. We're going to build a flying saucer. We're going to destroy aliens. We're going to make some money. We're all going to get rich. We're all going to be famous, whatever. And they're trying to get a control of it because they think it's a, a nuts and bolts thing. It's not a nuts and bolts thing. What it's way think, less than a, What do you think, Grant, from the forthcoming Biden administration? What are we going to see as compared to Trump's? Well, Biden was asked about it in 2007. Uh, I think Biden's, I think Biden's um, situation will be exactly the same as Obama. When Obama was asked about it, he said, what do you think about aliens uh, coming here? He said, well, there may be people coming here, but that's not my job. I'm here. There's people here on this earth that are in trouble, and that's my job. I think Biden will be the same thing. And that's the whole thing. Biden can't do anything. Yeah. Biden cannot pass anything. Right. You have this filibuster thing that 41 senators... Republican senators can block everything, and they are going to block everything that he proposes. So you can't get anything through. That's why I'm saying it's total, absolute gridlock. You cannot. The, the, the House of Representatives last wow. uh, session under Trump passed 260 bills. Not one of them was taken up by the Senate. You have a total gridlock. So Obama, uh, 
Biden cannot do anything. Why? I think he was asked about it in 2007 when uh, Kucinich, you remember Kucinich was asked about it, he, hearing the voice and stuff, and his political career was over when he, he said, yeah, he uh, had a UFO sighting and stuff like that. So they asked Biden at the end of that interview, MSNBC asked Biden, he said, what do you think about this UFO thing? And, he, and, Obi- and Bi- uh, Biden said, he said, UFOs? Are you kidding? Get serious. And it, he has no interest in it at all. So he's going to do the same thing. It's like we, we have, we got to get health care. Uh, we got to get the COVID bill. We got to get vaccines. Yeah. We'll worry about that down the road. But they will do this background thing. So what happens is the, the people that want it out will go to the president and say, we're running this program for gradual disclosure. Can we do it? And he says, yeah, go ahead with it. And he will give approval behind the scenes. So this these leaks are going to continue. They're going to intensify. There's actually a disclosure that will be coming. You'll hear about a disclosure coming out of Canada that I'm involved. It's not my story, so I can't talk about it right now. What? I was brought in as a researcher that wow. the, the, the Canadians are back involved in this thing. You're going to see a lot of disclosures, more of these leaks, more uh, they knew this, they knew that. Uh, the government is interested in this sort of stuff, but not on an official level. On an official level, the government is completely shut down. The U.S. government cannot do anything. The, the president has no power. He's basically going to have to find little back doors to get uh, his COVID bill through. Uh, he's trying to get this thing on, uh, you know, uh, African-American rights or, you know, people being equal and stuff. Those are his two main uh, things he's going to try to use outside uh, things, outside of using a vote to get them through. But you can't pass anything. That's how divided the world has become by the United States. That, so Biden has no control over this. You're going to see these gradual leaks in the background continue, but that's happening uh, off the record, in behind. And it's been going on all the way. Disney in 1956 was approached by the government to do a UFO documentary. My friend Bob Emenegger, 1975, was approached by Nixon uh, indirectly uh, through his people to do a documentary called UFOs, Past, Present, and Future, which we went out there, de- de- detailed a bunch of stuff. He was recontacted in the 1980s to do another documentary. And he said, what do you mean? Who, who's behind this? Is this Reagan? And they wanted, they said they wanted UFO stuff. They wanted the UFO films out. There was all these films. We want this stuff out. And and that documentary never took place. They've done it over. That's what they did, Tom DeLong. They went to Bill Moore. They contacted Bill Moore. They said, we're from the government. We want to get this stuff out without breaking the law. Bill Moore started to spread this stuff. Then they went to Tom DeLong. Tom DeLong is just the latest of what I call the messiahs. The people that believe that they're here to, to bring the message. And the government is feeding this stuff into these people. They're very powerful. They get the message out. That's why they're dealing with Tom DeLong. Because he can get the message out. He's got a huge uh, Twitter following, a huge Instagram following. They're trying to get the message. But it's plausible deniability. You're never going to confirm what he's getting. It's this indirect leaks. You take information, surrounded by disinformation, put it out. And everybody goes like, what's the real story? Like, what's going on? And everybody says, well, is, is Area 51 real? Do they have flying saucers there? And everybody says, I don't believe it. Oh, I believe it. I don't believe it. I believe it. And yet the information gets out that there may be UFOs at Area 51. Why they don't they, want why you didn't to they pick you, Grant? Sorry, sorry, why didn't they pick you for such an operation? Why did they pick you long and not you? Did. You're very experienced. They did. They did. Number one oh, is because I'm a Canadian. I, I actually got a phone oh, yeah. call. I got a phone call from a guy again, Kevin Albert, who uh, is actually sort of a uh, an assistant with Ron Pandolfi, who is the guy who maybe the guy who briefs President uh, um, tr- uh, President Trump. He's the briefer. He's been in 1983. He's uh, he's the guy that says it's a scout. and and so Kevin Albert phones me up. And he says, "I've been asked to <laughs> I've been asked to talk to you by U.S. intelligence." I said, "Come on." Give your head a shake. Come on, I'm a Canadian. Like, my well, U.S. intelligence wants you to talk to me, do they? And it's like, well, you know, and, and they wanted me to do, they had a thing in Hollywood. They're working through Hollywood. Yeah. They're putting these things through Hollywood. They wanted to do a documentary on what's called the Avery. All these inside guys yeah, who've been looking this stuff. And they wanted me to host this thing. I said, I'm willing to help you. I'll give you whatever you want. I will uh, do it. I'm not going to go on camera. I'm not going to be a, a talking, you know, a dancing bear on camera. I don't want to be on camera. I don't want to talk. I will help you. And that's where it was. And then I talked to the producer. And he told me about the fact that they'd come to him. They wanted um, some documentaries done on abduction. They wanted documentaries done on, on Avery. Uh, and they wanted a documentary done on a guy by the name of Joe Firmage who was a guy who was doing anti-gravity stuff. And he spent millions and millions and millions of dollars. And that proves that they don't have the anti-gravity stuff. He spent millions of dollars. He could not levitate this this thing off the table. And if he can't levitate it off the table and he's got all these millions of dollars, they ain't got nothing. And so they wanted this documentary. And the, the producer told him in Hollywood, they told uh, Ron Pandolfi, uh, this 
this does not move the needle at all. Nobody could care less about Joe Firmage and is 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 uh, levitating this thing off the table. If now, if you, Ron, want to go on camera and want to talk about what's really going on, that we're going to do a documentary. We'll do the Hollywood. We'll do that. So they're in Hollywood. They're pushing this stuff. There's six new TV shows coming out, and that's the way they do it. So instead of doing it face to face. What they do is they put it through Hollywood because that's what you do. If you're a skeptic, you can watch uh, alien, Ancient Aliens or whatever you're watching. And you go, ah, this is garbage. I'll watch this stupid show. And you don't realize you're being programmed. It's yeah. indirectly, it's not challenging. So if you come to a skeptic and go, the guy will make the sign of the cross and tell you to back away and get out of here. But if you do it indirectly through Hollywood, they're putting this through contact, through close encounters. What you asked about, have they got an interaction with the aliens? I absolutely believe that there was in 1971, there was an interaction, three UFOs went over Holloman Air Force Base, one landed, it was filmed, Bob Emminger, my friend, had the film in his hands, they had it, I know this actually happened, and, and so I said to Bob, at that point, um, uh, they, they put actually eight seconds in this film, which you can find on the internet, it's called UFOs, It Has Begun. It's on the internet. You can look up YouTube. In there, you'll see eight seconds of the film from the Holman landing before it gets in close, before you can see it. They show they're allowed to put it in the film. So this thing lands. And I said, you know, Bob, the weird thing is you had this uh, thing, uh, Holman, this landing and the three UFOs and the one lands. I said, you know, if it weren't for the location and the time of day, that's exactly like close encounters of the third kind. And he said, what? I didn't tell you. I said, no, you didn't tell me what? I said, I didn't tell you I gave a copy to Steven Spielberg. I said, no, you didn't tell me you gave a copy to Steven Spielberg. 1975, the documentary came out. He gave the documentary to Steven Spielberg. 1977, the same story. They're waiting for this UFO to land. There's three wow. UFOs come in. They're hovering. Wow. The one lands. The wow. aliens come out. There's an exchange. It's the same story. And then he said to me, he said, after, after Steven did the documentary, he said, I told you, Annie Spielberg. Steven's sister was a line producer for me. I told you that. You don't remember that. She was a producer. She said Steven wants the documentary. So I gave it to Steven. And then two years later, he comes out with the Close Encounters. They, they fictionalized the whole Air Force Base landing and they put it out. And Steven Spielberg's mother comes to Bob Emenegger later and she says, Bob, I've seen your version of the landing and I've seen Steven's version of the landing and I like Steven's version better. That's how they do it. They put wow. it in through movies, through documentaries. So the they put it in directly so it doesn't offend people. Yeah. So the Cross Encounters was based on UFO. It has begun. Just to clarify for the listeners, is that right? Is that what you're saying? On the Holloman Air Force Base film, the story is the Holloman Air Force Base. The the they, they had interactions, and they they knew these things were going to land. It happened at six o'clock in the morning. They had three cameras running, three on the ground, one in a helicopter, and this thing came in and it landed. And the beings got out, and they put the the UFO in a hangar, yeah. and they had this interaction, and then. Uh, the beings took off. I don't know what happened after that. But they actually gave the film to Bob Emenegger, and they had the film. And then what happened is the same as the Disney in 56. Disney was offered all this film and, and documentary. And then they put the documentary. At the very end, they said, oh, uh, but, uh, Coleman at the Pentagon says, we can't release the documentary. It's the, it's the, um, it's, uh, the Vietnam War. It's the, uh, uh, the Watergate thing. We can't release it. It's not, the time isn't right. You have to take the film back. You can't use the film in your documentary. And so they have to storyboard the thing. So what they do is they have eight seconds of the film, and then they basically storyboard the thing, and they show you what happened. So I said to Bob, I said, I thought you told me they took the documentary back. He said, well, they did. He told me this whole story, how they moved the documentary back to the Pentagon. And I said, but Bob, there's eight seconds of the film. You put eight seconds of the film in the documentary. And he went, well, yeah. And I said, you told me they took it back. We said, well, it was just background. I said, what do you mean it was just background? He said, well, it didn't show anything. <laughs> and so they allowed him to use this, and that's oh. what they do. They, they put it out, and then they pull it back, and they put it out, and they pull it back. So these documentaries are being done, and you can't confirm it. Yeah. So the story is the whole Air Force Base landing is out there, but oh. you can't confirm it. And, and they, they come up with another story. It was 1964. It wasn't 71. And you, they put out second stories. So that's what they do. In the disinformation works, you don't kill people. All you do is put out a crazy story that a bunch of people start to spread. And then you don't know, is Tony lying? Is Grant lying? They're telling two different stories. They're both full of it. And I don't know what to believe. And that's what they want. They don't want you to know for sure what's going on. They just want you to know there's some sort of force dealing with us. 
there may be UFOs at Area 51. There was a landing at Hall of Murray First Base. Uh, they, they're telling you all these indirect stories, and yeah. they're basically telling you the story without telling you the story, yeah, without you being able to confirm the story. Because once they confirm the story, once you spill the milk, you can't put it back in the jar. They know that. If they want to tell you what's going on, they're going to put the president of the United States up. They're going to stand the CIA director, and they're going to tell you what's going on. They don't want to tell you what's going on. They want to sort of tell you what's going on. The secrecy is absolutely ruthless. Uh, I've I've been threatened uh, in the past with it all. Um, it's real. The secrecy behind it is real, and it, it, it's it, it's sending us down a very nefarious path as far as I'm concerned. Grant, listen, that this is all we've got time for on Alien Confidential. Uh, you've been a, a tremendous guest. Could I ask where would listeners go to find out more and get your books and things like that? Um, well, the books they can get on Amazon. There's uh, There'll be about 12 books in, in by the end of this month. There'll be 12 books. Um so just get my Grant Cameron on Amazon. But the, the thing I would like to people to go is I have two. I put all my latest stuff on uh, uh, my Facebook, which is Presidential UFO, not Grant Cameron. Presidential UFO Facebook. You'll see the latest stuff that I post day right. by day as, as oh, I put on there. And the, and the other thing I have is White House UFO Grant Cameron YouTube. And that's where I put all the interviews that I do on art on experience. I do a lot of experiencers things. I do a lot of near death experience stuff. Uh, I go through all the paranormal stuff. And uh, so those are two, the white house UFO YouTube and the presidential UFO Facebook. All right, we've got to get this in grant. I was surprised actually, just in closing, perhaps you could tell the listeners about this. I was surprised looking through all your stuff and your interviews that you're into art with UFOs. And I was just interested to know how that came about. Well, it was all the same thing. I, I look for these patterns. So um, because because I suddenly realized with the I did the music book. I got a Chris Bledsoe. I mentioned this very famous experiencer. Yeah. I had a very bizarre experience with him. He calls me in nineteen in in two thousand fourteen, yeah. and he says to me, Grant, I got a message from the Guardians. These are these beings he's dealing with. They got a message for you. And I go, They got a message for me? Really? Cool. What what do they want me to know? And he said, They want you to know the message is in the music. And I went, What really? Well, you may be talking to the wrong guy, Chris, because I don't listen to music. I don't play music. I could care less about music. I have no interest in music. And he said, oh, you should listen to the song called Cashmere by Led Zeppelin. I go, whatever, Chris. And then then this is how they drag you in. So he said, oh, and the other song you should listen to is After the Gold Rush by Neil Young. If you listen to that song, the last half of the lyrics, it's about taking the silver, the silver seeds come down and they take the chosen ones off the planet. There's a bombed out basement. They, we've destroyed the world. It's like a gold. It's a gold rush. So it's like when the gold is gone, it's going to become a ghost town. That's the lyrics. And I said, Neil Young, Neil Young is involved in this thing. And, and, and he said, yeah. And I said, I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, which is a city in Canada where not even anybody in Canada wants to visit. But Neil Young grew up here. That's how they got me. It's like Neil Young's involved. And I started to look and I realized that all these guys were experiencers. So they, after the gold rush, and then I realized that Patty Smith had sang after the gold rush. Patty Smith is an experiencer. She doesn't even believe she's from this planet. She sang Gloria, first woman to sing on Saturday Night Live. Then I realized there was at least six or seven experiencers who were definitely UFO, very famous musicians. Then I realized that the Moody Blues have been abducted going into, uh, they're coming from Manchester, going into London on the motorway. And they have this abduction experience in 1967. And they start putting these lyrics in their songs. And I realized this is for real. So I wrote that whole thing, realizing that the, 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 the intelligence is using musicians. Because when you're a kid, like yeah. if you've got a kid, between the time he's one and 10 years old, your kid, you're the hero. Once your kid is 10 years old, get away from me, dad. I don't want you around here. And that, so they go through the musicians because a kid between 10 and 25, when they're setting their ideas in life, are listening to musicians. Yeah. So they're putting the That's messages right. through to these kids. And That's then I realized right. that there was this connection to art. The same thing with art. There's a lot of experiencers who yeah. suddenly they had their experience with the UFO and they went running out and got a canvas and started painting. And so I started doing all these. I realized there's all these artists and you're one where they have, they're doing art and they're experiencers. And there's thousands of these people, unbelievable number. Grant, uh, listen, uh, thank you so much. You've been a first-class guest, uh, and hopefully we'll have you on again. Please keep me updated as to the Canadian stuff that you're dealing with as well. Uh, and I must sincerely thank you for your time, your compassion, and commitment to your subject. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. Let's do it again sometime, and well, let's do your let's do an interview with you. And you've got your book coming out. I'll put you on my uh, yes. my YouTube channel, yeah. which has a pretty yeah. pretty high traffic. You can yes. get some exposure. 
Tony Topping has lived a secret double life involving UFOs and close encounters with aliens. I, Alien, The Secret UFO Chronicles, tells of his 40 years of experiences with the world of paranormal espionage and UFOs. The current situation has led to a type of alien cold war in the skies above by forces unknown to the human world. And the formation of a secret communication network not governed by time. The warning from aliens against human conflict is very real. With art inspired by his close encounters, I, Alien, The Secret UFO Chronicles. The opinions expressed on Alien Confidential are those of the hosts and guests. They do not purport to reflect the views of the radio station Access Northwest. The material in the broadcast should be classed for entertainment value only.